through his holy word. That's how God communicates his message to man today. But in the first century, he spoke miraculously through the apostles and the prophets. So it begs the question, what does the Bible say about miracles? This has always been a rather controversial topic in the religious world. Most of the controversy is caused because of the misunderstanding of the biblical definition of a miracle. What people call a miracle today is the wrong thing. What people call miracles today are the wrong thing. What is the biblical definition of a miracle? One of my most significant mentors, God rest his soul, Stafford North, used to say that it is a complete, observable, instantaneous, supernatural event. And I like this definition because too many times we're caught trying to call something a miracle that isn't a miracle, like the miracle of childbirth. Childbirth is amazing, but it does not fit the biblical definition. We'll call something a miracle like someone gets sick and, and, and a doctor says, you have six months to live. And then that person goes back and the doctor says, well, whatever it was that was, was causing your demise is gone. There's no trace of it. Listen, God is responsible for childbirth. God is responsible for every sick person who gets well. We give God the glory for that, but that just doesn't meet the definition. Another example would be an upset in competition. You know from 1980, the miracle on ice. Listen, that was not a miracle. Those young men worked hard. They trained hard, and they outplayed the Russians, and America won the gold medal. And you can look at a, a, a thousand examples of upsets in competition. They just don't meet the biblical definition of a miracle. A Bible miracle is a complete, observable, instantaneous, supernatural event. It's like Jesus feeding 5,000 people with barely a meal big enough for two. It's like Lazarus being raised from the dead. The text you remember says, he stinketh. He was dead four days. It's like Jesus healing the blind man in John chapter 9. The man that was blind from his mother's womb. He was known to be blind. It's like Jesus healing the deaf and mute. One man afflicted with both issues. And Jesus, in an instant, healed that man. It's like Jesus healing the lame. Or let's consider this morning, if you have your Bibles and you care to follow along, Acts chapter 3, verses 2 through 10. I think this is a fine example of a complete, observable, instantaneous, supernatural event. Here's a lame man that was healed by Peter and John. It says, And a certain man who had been lame from his mother's womb, who was being carried along, whom they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms for those who were entering the temple. And when they saw, when he saw Peter and John, about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. Now, I just want you to notice about this man. He was lame from his mother's womb. He was in the same place at the same time every day. People knew that this man had never walked. That's the part of this that makes the miracle of, of observable. Notice he says in verse 4, And Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze upon him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. Someone has said about this passage that you could tell that Peter was a gospel preacher because he said, silver and gold have I none. And I love that little joke, but the one I love more is the one about the gospel preacher who woke up with a gun to his head in the middle of the night and a robber was saying, give me all your money. And he nervously said, calm down, calm down, I'll turn the lights on and help you look for it. <clears throat> But notice here in verse 7, it says, And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately, see, it was instantaneous. His feet and his ankles were strengthened. And with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered into the temple with them, 
Listen, walking and leaping and praising God. This was complete. This wasn't a guy who was in a wheelchair that you never knew before the day you saw him in the wheelchair. And someone laid their hands on him and he, and he struggled to stand up and he, and he stumbled to take a few steps. This man had never taken a step in his life. And the text says that he walked and leaped and praised God. And verse 9 says, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. It was observable. And they were taking note of him being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Look at Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. These are examples of biblical miracles. And these signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And, th and if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. These are examples of complete, observable, instantaneous, supernatural events. And by supernatural, I mean the only way to explain it is that God did it. And, and someone says, well, we can do that. Well, what I want to say is... If you say that you can handle snakes and be bit by a poisonous snake and it doesn't harm you, let me pick the snake. If you say, I can drink a deadly poison and it won't harm me, let me pick the poison. If you say, I can heal the sick, I can take a man who is destined for death, and it's obvious to all, and you then can bring him back to his full health, let me pick the sick person. I know one of the objections here is, well, the reason you don't believe in miracles is, is, is it, 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 or the reason you can't see a miracle is because of your unbelief. The reason you can't experience it is because of your unbelief. It's your lack of faith. But I want you to see what the Bible has to say about that. Look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse 58. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 58. Matthew records for us, and he, talking about Jesus, did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Now, he's in, he's in this hometown, and the people don't believe who he is. And so if it were true that you can't experience a biblical miracle because of unbelief, because of a lack of faith, well, then the text really should say he didn't do any. But it doesn't say that he didn't do any. It says that he didn't do many. And the reason it says that is because it is not a requirement to experience a miracle to believe in miracles. You don't have to have the faith. In fact, the miracles were done for exactly the opposite reason. It was to create confidence in who Jesus was and in what his message was. Look at Numbers chapter 14 and verse 11. This same teaching can be found in the Old Testament as well. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me? despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst. There's another compelling example in Acts chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Look at Acts chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. This is stark unbelief, and yet they acknowledge the miracle, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact, the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. You see, not only is it a fact, not only is it noteworthy, but it's also, according to Luke here, recording these events, undeniable. So verse 17 says, in order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. Surely the Bible teaches that you don't have to have faith to witness a miracle. Unbelief and a lack of faith are not a reason why you can't experience a miracle. It's ludicrous to say that faith is a prerequisite to experiencing a biblical miracle. I'm reminded of the familiar story about a charismatic preacher that explains the, the, the abuse of the term miracle. You know the story. I'm sure you do about the fellow that was in his home and the floodwaters were rising and he was on the second story of his home and he was looking out the window and and a boat went by, and they came over to the house and said, look, you know, you need to get on. These, these flood rise, waters are going to keep rising. He said, oh, no, the Lord will provide a miracle. I put all my trust in him. And so the boat went on, and 
the waters kept rising. Now he's in the attic and he's, he's peering out a small window and another boat comes by and, and, and says, Look, you, need, you need to get on. The, the waters are still rising. He goes, no, no, the Lord will provide a miracle. I put all my trust in God. And so the waters kept rising and he was forced out onto the roof of his house and he, he barely had any of the roof left and a helicopter comes down and, and says, listen, you need to get on board. He goes, no, no, I trust the Lord. He'll provide a miracle. And the waters kept rising and the man drowned and he stood before God and judged. He said, Lord, what happened, man? I, I believed, I trusted. And the Lord said, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What were you waiting for, right? See, look, that is truly the providence of God. But that's not a miracle. That does not fit the picture of what the Bible calls a miracle. You know, there's another story, and I don't remember all the details, but it's about a Russian who was taking a tour in New York City. He was, he was being uh, led by a New York City tour guide, and every time they came to a building, they would talk about the number of stories and how long it, it took to, to build the building. And, and every time they saw the building, the Russian had the same response. We have one twice that tall, build it in half the time. And finally, they come upon the Empire State Building, and he goes, now, now how many stories tall is that building, and, and how long did it take to build that building? And the tour guide said, I don't know, it wasn't there yesterday. <laughs> now listen, that's funny, but if that were true, that would be a miracle. That would be a complete observable, instantaneous, supernatural event. There's a difference between what the Bible calls a miracle and what the Bible calls providence. And, and you know, the danger in a lesson like this is for you to walk away and think that I think, to think that the church thinks, to think that the Bible represents a God who's not involved in the lives of his people. Nothing could be further from the truth. I believe that God is at work. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13 says that he is at work, both to will and to work, according to his good pleasure. Acts 17, 28, it is in him that we live and move and have our very being. God is at work Amen. in this world. But what people call miracles today are the wrong thing. That's number one. Number two they're for the wrong reason. Biblical miracles were, were performed for proof and confirmation. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, they were to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 47. Gospel of John, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verses 47 and 48. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and we're saying, what are we doing? For if this man, for this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Jesus was doing miracles to prove who he was. Luke records the same thing in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 at the beginning of of Peter's first gospel sermon. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested, a man accredited, a man approved, depending on your translation, but they all mean exactly the same thing. It says that, that God attested him with miracles, wonders, and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Not only were miracles performed in the first century to prove that Jesus was the Son of God, but they were also performed to confirm the Word of God. Look at verse 33 of Acts 2. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth this which you both see and hear. You see, there was a miracle taking place in that this revelation was given to the apostles by God, and he confirmed that revelation with miracles, wonders, and signs. The miracle in particular at this time was these unlearned, uneducated, untrained men speaking in all the languages of the people from every nation under heaven. How could they do that? Because God worked with them. Miracles allowed the apostles to speak with the authority to authenticate the message that God gave them. Look at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 12. 
In Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 12, Luke says, And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet, whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. And Elamus, the magician, for thus his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze upon him and said, You who are full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? You know, when I hear that, I, I think that our preaching is actually pretty kind in comparison, don't you? Wow, that is some strong, strong condemning language. Verse 11, And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. You see, the message that was being preached was confirmed by this miracle. They believed when, when, when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Look at Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20, just after the verses we read at the beginning of the lesson. Mark 16 Verses 19 and 20. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. You have the same concept in Acts chapter 14 and verse 3. Acts chapter 14 and verse 3 says, Therefore... They spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their name. How could you trust this message in the first century? This wasn't the Old Testament. This was the giving of the New Testament before it was in written form. Well, according to Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, it was confirmed with miracles, wonders, and signs. According here to Luke in Acts chapter 14 and verse 3, it was confirmed with miracles, wonders, and signs. And you have the exact same concept in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Hebrews 2, 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to, to, to us by those who heard, God also bearing witness with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Now, someone else says, well, you know, what about the purpose of alleviating human suffering? Frankly, if that were the purpose of miracles, not even Jesus and the apostles and prophets did a good job because there were still many, uh, many sick people, many people that were, were suffering, those today who make that same claim. But, but we're actually helping people. We got hospitals full of sick people. We have people dying every day who could be aided if this were the purpose, but it's not to alleviate human suffering. It's to prove that Jesus is God's son and that the Bible is his word. And if it were to alleviate human suffering, it would be poorly done. Someone else says, well, they're a mark of spiritual maturity. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verses 22 and 23, and this is, this is a passage you're familiar with, maybe used a little bit differently, but I believe it's used in context. Notice here, Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That's miraculous. And in your name cast out demons? That's miraculous. And in your name perform many miracles? That's miraculous. But what does Jesus say about these people? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice Lawlessness. An interesting note about John the Baptist. Look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 15. The Gospel of Luke chapter 1 and verse 15 says, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. So John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, among those born of, of women, 
There has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What, what does that have to do with this point about miracles not being a mark of spiritual maturity? Look at the Gospel of John, chapter 10, and verse 41. John 10, 41 says, And many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. John is one to be emulated. John was held up by our Lord. John was full of the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, and yet John never did a sign in his entire ministry. Look at Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They were feeling pretty good about this power that they had. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all over the power uh, and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall injure you. Nevertheless, Jesus said, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. It's not about the ability to do a miracle. It's about being faithful to our Lord. What people call miracles today are for the wrong purpose. They're, in, they're the wrong thing. They're for the wrong purpose. And what people call miracles today are in the wrong time. Biblical miracles were passed on by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. Here we read of Philip the evangelist. He obviously had interaction with an apostle somewhere along the lines. And in verse 5 it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. But in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. The point is, why did they listen to Philip proclaiming Christ? Because he confirmed that message with miracles, wonders, and signs. But Philip received that power from an apostle. Look at verses 14 through 20. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They'd simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the, that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Simon stated a, a, a clear, true, biblical message that the Spirit was passed on by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19 and verse 6. You remember those 12 disciples that were baptized into Christ by Paul. Well, after he baptized them into Christ, he laid his hands on them. What did they do? Acts 19 and verse 6 says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. Romans 1.11, Paul said, I long to be with you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, that you may be established. Well, Paul... Why do you have to be there? Why can't God just do it directly from heaven? Of course he could, but that's not the pattern. The pattern is exactly like it was when Peter and John had to go down to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8. It's exactly like it was when Paul was in Ephesus with those 12 disciples. And it's exactly what he was writing to the church in Rome. I need to come and lay my hands on you that I can impart some spiritual gift to you. You might remember 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6 where Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that's within you. How, Timothy? By the laying on of my hands, by an apostle. What does this have to do with our lesson this morning on the end of the miraculous age? Well, look at Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Acts chapter 1, 
verses 21 and 22. It is therefore necessary that of the men who accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. The fact of the matter is, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, were passed on by the laying on of an apostle's hand. And to be an apostle, you had to be with Jesus from the beginning of his personal ministry to his ascension, and you had to be an eyewitness of his resurrection. Well, how many of us, not only in this assembly today, but in this entire world, meet those qualifications? Not a single solitary one. And so when the apostles died, the ability to pass on the gifts died too. When those that had those abilities died, those gifts passed on in, in accordance with the prediction of Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 2. Zechariah 13 and verse 2 says, It will come about in, in that day, declares the Lord, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they will no longer be remembered, and I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirit from the land. Well, when did that happen? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 10 says, When the perfect comes the parts will be done away with. The perfect is the completed revelation of God's word. Remember, that message that they did not have in the first century, they were exclusively relying upon the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit to give that message and to confirm that message. In 1 John 4 and verse 7 says, test the spirits to see whether they're of God. You know why? Because there could be anyone walking around saying that they're speaking on behalf of God. But God saw fit to make sure there was a way that that message could be confirmed. We're almost through, but let's finish with Jude, verse 3. Jude, verse 3. In Jude, verse 3, Jude says something very important that's very similar to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 10. He said, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. It was one time given. That leaves no room for new revelation. That leaves no room for re-revelation. The perfect has come. The parts are done away with. And people have a misunderstanding about miracles today because they are the wrong thing. Amen. Frankly, just consider the evidence. Read what the Bible says about miracles and then evaluate what people today claim are miracles. They're just not the same thing. They are for the wrong reason. The reason was to confirm the word of God. Now listen, if these are the same kind of miracles, do you understand? There are many religious movements who claim this power. They're contradictory messages. How could God confirm a message that's contradictory? I'm telling you, the simple solution to that apparent contradiction is to know that these are not the same kind of miracles. It's not the same thing. And they are in the wrong time. And I want to finish where we started, where Brother James read for us this morning. John 20, 30 and 31, I think is a good distinction between the two. Many other signs. Therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. We have written in this book all that Jesus did that we need. There were, there were so many that, they, that the book couldn't contain all of them. But, but it does address the miraculous age. But then verse 31 says, These have been written that you might believe, and that believing you might have life in his name. They couldn't rely on the Bible the way we can today. They needed the miracles that Jesus performed. The scripture, however, can cause you to believe. The scripture can convince you to repent. The scripture can compel you to confess. And the scripture can convict you to be baptized. We, we don't need the miracles. Their purpose really is fulfilled. They're the wrong thing for the wrong reason. They're in the wrong time. But we have a perfect revelation from God to do everything that those miracles were intended to do in the first century. And maybe we have someone here today who needs to respond to the gospel of Christ. Maybe you need the prayers of the church. Maybe you want to.